This is the first of the videos that we're going to do at, on glucose homeostasis and this first one is basically looking at why glucose is so important to our bodies and um, what some of the things are that can happen if we either suffer from having too much glucose in our bloodstream or too little glucose in our bloodstream. So just a very quick reminder about some examples of these homeostatic mechanisms. In other words, these mechanisms that are in place to regulate changes back to a set point or back to a normal. So two examples um, are here. Um, this place here we have a toilet system. So many of you may not actually have even noticed how toilets work. So right now, assuming that hygiene is alright, um, I'd like you to stop the video Go and um, look at your toilet. If you can, take the lid off and tell your parents what you're doing. And you're saying, I'm doing biology by looking in the toilet. And that doesn't sound too dodgy at all. And um, look at the mechanism that is in place to regulate the water balance in your toilet system. So basically what happens is that when you flush the toilet, this will empty out. This is actually called um, basically a ball um, system here. And it's like a ball that has air in it. And um, as the water level drops, this one drops down too. That triggers off this mechanism here that will open up a tap that fills the water system back up. As the ball floats on top of the water, it will rise back up. And when that water is back up to a set point level, um, this ball system actually stops more water from coming in. So there you go, homeostasis all happening in your bathroom. Nice. Um, a second example is over here. So this is um, just a thermostat mechanism and we've talked about this in class previously. So basically you are setting the temperature to a desired point. In this case it's 22.5 degrees Celsius. Should the room temperature uh, decrease below that you will get the heaters kicking in to bring the temperature back up. Or should the temperature rise above 22 and a half degrees, then maybe fans or some kind of cooling mechanism will kick in. Once again, here is a very general um, schematic diagram of a feedback loop. And it's just it's representative of what we're going to be looking at for glucose, just like we looked at for osmoregulation and just like we looked at for thermoregulation as well. So it's a system of um, checking checking where something is at. So let's start at the top. So example here, the thing that needs to be controlled has, has made itself become too high, has become too high. So there is some feedback in place that gets activated to decrease this thing back down. But then this thing is now too low um, from what we, for what we want it to be. And so another process kicks in, another feedback process kicks in to increase the thing. So it's a continual cycle of checking in having some kind of control center that activates an effector and then a rechecking in again. So um, this is where we move on to the actual glucose part um, of homeostasis. Um, obviously we, we will look at it in a lot of detail as to how glucose is regulated in our bodies, but this video is not quite going to get up to that. We're just going to be looking at the importance of glucose in our bodies. The subsequent videos will go through um, the regulation of glucose. So glucose is immensely important to us. It is what we call the ultimate biofuel, basically because it is a raw ingredient in respiration. So our cells use it to carry out respiration. It's hard to see, but there's actually a little man down here. So this little man is carrying out respiration with it. But where did his glucose come from, you say? So um, we know that he... he uh, his glucose came from eating it. So that's where we obtain our glucose from. Um, in this case, we're looking at plants that have produced glucose in the case of photosynthesis. But don't forget that because we are omnivores as, as humans, we also eat animals that have subsequently consumed or previously consumed plants. And so generally speaking, um, plants are the source of our glucose by carrying out um, photosynthesis and they get that energy in turn from the sunlight. So glucose is this major source of currency in terms of energy. We know that ATP um, is the end result of that and that, that really is the source of energy that gets used. But we find it very difficult to generate ATP without having glucose as a raw ingredient for that process. So highly, highly important. A summary of um, how we use energy in our lives 
and you should be well aware of all of these factors. None of this should be new information to you. It's all kind of a revision of the last couple of years of biology that you've learned. So obviously um, chemical energy comes in the, in the form of several different um, food types, including carbohydrates, fats, um, and some other sources that we can use energy for. We consume that food, we take it into our body, um, and by carrying out the process of respiration after digestion and um, exchange of gases and things like that have occurred, we can generate ATP, and this is our energy currency. This is the, 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 the money, as it were, that our cells deal in in order to carry out reactions. Um, so ATP in turn drives metabolism, and metabolism, which is um, basically just a collection of biological reactions that are being carried out so it could be enzymatic reactions any other reaction that our body is using to kind of carry out its normal day-to-day -day processes as a result of carrying out metabolism we produce heat in our bodies okay um, the production of ATP as well also generates heat and um, important to note too here that we have to, we do have waste that we need to deal with in our bodies. So um, including carbon dioxide that our lungs will exchange through the process of gas exchange and we'll breathe that out. And water can also be an unwanted byproduct. Although as we know from osmoregulation, most of this water we do actually end up reabsorbing into our body. Um, this slide's also quite good to note how we're starting to tie together thermoregulation so look production of heat production of heat you can think about how thermoregulation deals with that and also up here water so um, water being consumed water being excreted how does osmoregulation deal with that water that um, comes in and leaves our bodies Okay, so why is regulating blood glucose so vitally important? And this is the most important reason, as it says up here. Um, some tissues um, can actually use a range of different energy sources, like fats and amino acids, um, in order to, to carry out these reactions to generate energy. But very important tissues, like the brain that we have down here, can only use glucose. And so what that means is that um, we need a sort of really reliable source, constant supply of glucose in order to, to function properly. Um, glucose is highly regulated in terms of the levels and generally, um, you'll see this in your notes, but it's regulated between about 4 and 7 millimolar in the blood. Um, and so we do not have a tolerance for glucose levels fluctuating very well. And we'll look at this in much more detail when we go into to the sort of the nitty gritty points. Um, down here as well, as well as the um, brain, um, red blood cells and immune cells also um, need glucose only in order to carry out their functions. So, so very, very important. Because the brain is so dependent upon glucose, if the blood glucose levels fall below about two and a half millimolar, so remember that I said the normal levels were between four and seven, so this is about two and a half, um, you actually start having seizures and can go into coma. So you might have heard about people going into, probably on the TV actually, rather than real life, um, but going into diabetic comas. Um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later in this um, unit when we, we look at diabetes in much more detail. But basically your brain stops functioning. Um, it really is a matter of life and death. If you do not um, get your glucose levels back up, your brain stops functioning. It stops telling your body to breathe. It stops telling your heart to beat. Um, and so you actually do die when your glucose levels fall below this level for a sustained period of time. A little bit of extra information in here, which is not necessary for you to know, but it's very interesting. There is a form of um, imaging technique called PET, which is not related to animals, as it mentions up here, um, but it's called positron emission tomography. And basically, it's a way of um, people consume um, glucose that has had a special little radioactive label put onto it. So you can see that mentions it here. And... Um, and we kind of we can scan people's bodies to pick up this radioactive glucose. Now, generally, this is a technique that is used in um, detecting where tumors are, cancerous tumors are in people's bodies, just because tumors are also, um, they consume a lot of glucose. And so the glucose tends to hang around where these tumors are. 
But you can see in this image here of this body that um, as well as picking up these tumors down in the abdominal region here, you can actually see the liver is just here. And so there's tumors around here. But oh my goodness, look at that brain. Okay, so the dark colors here are representing um, high levels of glucose and the brain is completely saturated with it. So um, this form of imaging just goes to show how highly dependent upon glucose that our brains are. So um, coming back to the reasons why regulating blood glucose is so important, um, we had the most important reason being that tissues like brain are so vitally um, dependent upon glucose because they can't use other so forms of energy. Next most important reason, um, this is to do with the fact that um, we, we do need glucose all the time, as we've just said, but we're not going around spending the entire day consuming food. We sleep at night time when we don't eat. You go for, for periods of hours between meals, um, and therefore we need a system for being able to store the glucose that we have already consumed and to allow for it to be released at appropriate times so that we get a regular release of glucose into our bloodstreams. It also means that if we didn't have a system for storing it, that our blood sugar or the blood glucose would be all over the place. And every time we consumed a meal, we'd get this, this blood sugar rush, huge amounts of blood glucose. But then as that got used up by the tissues, it would drop down significantly. So the liver comes into play here. The liver is the main place that we are storing glucose in our body. It's actually stored um, as a form called glycogen, which instead of having the individual um, sugar molecules that glucose is, they form long chains together. And so it's basically, glycogen is basically a whole lot of chains of glucose that just stores it as a, um, a sort of a more stable form. Um, and what that means is that because we've got this glucose stored in our body, there is a system in place that if we are, um, if we're between meals and our blood glucose drops, then the liver has this ability to be able to release more glucose out. The liver actually has enough um, glucose stored in it to sustain us for about two to three days. And that is why um, even though with water we're very susceptible, so um, our body is much more susceptible to dropping water levels, um, glucose we can sustain ourselves for, for a couple of days, um, but after that point in time um, they can drop and we can suffer quite serious consequences as we talked about previously. So the liver is considered to be a bit of a um, rechargeable battery in the sense that when we consume glucose, um, it's able to be stored in the liver in the form of glycogen, so converted to glycogen and stored. But then when we need to use that glucose, it is, um, it's converted back from glycogen into glucose and the energy is then released out of that liver. So much like um, a rechargeable battery that you can charge up and then discharge as you use the energy, that, that's kind of the similar way that the liver functions. Um, another um, sort of final reason why regulating blood glu glucose is important. So we know that low levels of glucose is quite a significant problem um, in the short term. So it becomes quite serious very quickly. But high levels of glucose can actually become um, have quite significant health effects over the long term. So over the short term, you're not likely to, to suffer many consequences from having high blood glucose. But um, over a period of years, in fact months even, but months to years generally, um, what can happen is that the glucose builds up in your bloodstream. It ends up binding to proteins that are in your circulation. And it can actually cause a whole lot of problems in very small capillaries um, and, in, and in blood vessels or sort of blood vessel beds. Um, there is this process called glycation where um, like these proteins get glucose molecules added to them. They obviously um, are then going to become much larger than they were before. And in very small blood vessels, they can actually block them and um, stop the blood from being able to get to that place. So very, very common in diabetic patients where they have um, not good regulation of their blood glucose and they can often end up with very high blood glucose levels over a prolonged period of time. We'll talk about this later when we do diabetes. Um, but you end up with poor circulation because these sugars have basically clogged up all of the blood vessels. 
and it is very, very common. And I picked a nice diagram for you here, but if you go and Google diabetic foot problems, um, it will bring up a whole lot of um, not so pleasant looking images of self-amputating toes, self-amputating feet, where these poor individuals have developed gangrene because there is no circulation getting down into their circulation. So fingers are very common as well. They'll often lose fingertips. Um, you can also get a lot of problems in your feet in terms of developing ulcers and sores that don't heal up because the blood supply is not great enough to that area. Um, and they very commonly can lose limbs. So you, um, if you see someone walking around on the street, an older person who is missing a lower leg, more often than not, that is due to diabetes. Uh, much more common than you would imagine it would be. Um, another side effect is one over here, and this is to do with problems um, in, the, in the eyes that diabetic patients can develop. So as well as um, this one here, which is called retinopathy, and you can actually see these little blood vessels in the back of the eye. So um, in the retina, at the very back, you have a whole lot of blood vessels, that um, very, very tiny blood vessels that supply the retina with, um, with blood, basically. And what happens is that these can get clogged up and um, they actually end up leaking. So they leak fluid into the eye itself. The pressure in the eye itself builds up and this can actually cause damage to the lens um, as well as basically just generating high pressure. So it can damage the retina, it can damage the lens. They tend to develop glaucoma and they can also have a lot of problems with retinal detachment and things like that. So um, these are just two of the, the common things that can happen in diabetes because of sustained high glucose levels. Not very pleasant. Okay, so as requested, we are going to have a little quiz at the end of this video. And um, what I'm going to do is I'll read through these questions, get you guys to pause the video and find some paper. Um, and you can write down the answers to these questions as we go. And then the next slide, don't cheat, the next slide will um, we'll quickly run through those answers. Okay, so um, firstly, why is glucose so important to the functioning of our bodies? Second question, where is the main place glucose is stored in our body? Third question, what can happen in our bodies if we have too little glucose? And last question, what can happen with too much glucose, in particular over a prolonged period of time? Okay, so pause this now, write down the questions, and then we're going to flick over to the next one, which will have the answers on it. Right, let's run through the answers. So... Um, first question, basically we're just um, referring to the idea that many of our body tissues can use several different um, food sources for energy, so they can use fats, they can even use amino acids, but the brain in particular, as well as red blood cells and immune cells, can only use glucose, and so it's very, very important that we have this regulation of glucose in our bodies. Second question, our livers are the main place that glucose is stored. It is stored in the form of glycogen, which is a basically a chain of glucose molecules. Third question, with too little glucose, very quickly our brain stops functioning properly and it can also lead to coma and death. And it's that magic number, that 2.5 millimolar, that the blood um, glucose blood levels fall below, which can become quite significant and serious. And final question, in the short term, not actually, not much will happen if you've got too much glucose in your bloodstream, but over long term, you can end up with quite significant damage to the cells, um, in particular because sugar starts binding to these proteins and clogging up um, the capillaries. So some examples of that um, would be um, self-amputation and gangrene, or it could be eye problems um, or anything like that, basically damage to tissues. I hope you did well. Um, so this has basically just been a summary of the importance of glucose and the next video will move through how we actually regulate glucose.